Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a red fruit or red fruit. Ready? Oh. Oh, this is red fruit. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. I don't think it's red fruit. Right. No. That doesn't sound like a street name I've ever it heard It does not. <laughs> We're good to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and call the meeting uh, to order. Good evening, everybody. Um, we do have two um, uh, two approved or excused absences tonight. Dr. Mellywish will not be here. And um, uh, uh, Emily uh, Demarest will not uh, also was not able to make uh, make it tonight, but she let me know uh, that she would not make it. So, uh, for the sake of our recording secretary, who will be uh, watching and listening after the fact, let's go around the table and everybody go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Aaron Wright. I'm the chair of the Environmental Concerns Committee for the City of Kalamazoo. I'm James Baker. I'm the Public Services Director and City Engineer here tonight as a guest. Hi, I'm Jean Hess, Kalamazoo City Commission and Liaison to Environmental Concerns Committee. Hi, I'm Joe Bauer. I'm with the ECC. Aaron Deaver with the ECC. Ian Magnuson, Vice Chair, ECC. Rob Likas, ECC member. Uh, David Benack, ECC. Gail Walter, ECC member. And Bobby Glasser, ECC member. All right, and uh, everything is going good. We've got a live stream. That's all. All I think we we were assured that that is working. So hopefully uh, people are able to watch and listen in at home. Um, I did send out an uh, agenda for everybody's approval. Are there any uh, comments or questions, concerns about uh, the agenda? All right, is there a motion to approve? Oh, that's all right. <laughs> that's okay. Is the uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So motion. Second. Yeah. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. All right. The agenda is approved. Mm -hmm. uh, August meeting minutes. That should say. I I apologize. That should say uh, September mm -hmm. um, meeting minutes. I didn't. I did send out the draft uh, meeting minutes from September. Mm -hmm. um, were there any uh, corrections there that we want to note here before we move on? Yes. Uh, under new business, under the Urban Bird Treaty, um, uh, the communities that have signed on, uh, the list included Portage and the city of Kalamazoo. Um, that is not correct. Um, Kalamazoo County Parks and Rec had signed on by last month. Um, we're still pending the city of Portage, and at that time we were pending the city of well, we were pending the city of Portage and the city of Kalamazoo at that time. Okay. Right. Okay. Any anybody else have any corrections to the minutes that you notice? All right. So uh, just like we do it every month, um, if you, you know, you've got a few more days to check over the minutes if they're. But if I don't hear um, any more corrections from anybody, um, I will go go ahead and request uh, a final copy of the meeting minutes from September. So is there a motion to approve uh, the September meeting minutes? So motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Meeting minutes are taken care of for this month. Uh, announcement. What's going on uh, in Kalamazoo, environmentally speaking? Yes, and electronic recycling is this Saturday, October 22nd, uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Okay. okay. Can I just ask, what are the lights? It's like really um, uh, The lights are because, are for the, the TV camera. I just want to turn the light on. Right. Are you recording? Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. is that? I don't have a problem. Yeah. yeah. That was okay. Yeah. <laughs> ah. yeah, thanks. Thank man. you. Thank you. Yeah. It's a little better. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's also this Saturday the um, 
neighbor environmental stewardship project with uh, the Vine and Edison is doing a tree planting on uh, Saturday morning at uh, 9 a.m. Where's that at? Uh, it will be on Fulford Street. Okay. This weekend also the Earth Day thing on Sunday, or is that the yeah. following weekend? Uh, that's uh, another event. I'm not in one one three three coalition. Twelve thirty to three thirty. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, yeah. On Sunday or Saturday? Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. 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 in Bronson. Bronson. In Bronson Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, do we have any um, callers that were uh, hoping to make comments tonight? And then once we finish with callers. We've got anybody. We don't typically get guests at our meeting, so welcome everybody. Mm -hmm. Delightful to see everybody uh, here and uh, so interested in what's going on. Um, and we'll get to our in-person uh, comments uh, after our call-ins. Someone on the phone. Okay. We have a three-minute limit for our phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. Do you have a comment for the Environmental Concerns Committee tonight? Yes, and my comment is on my comment is under three minutes, so I'm asking Aaron not to interrupt me this time, please. This is Brandy Crawford Johnson. Um, I just want to say to the new ECC members to take everything Eagle says with a grain of salt. Eagle is still the same MBE2 they were during the Flint water crisis. They changed their name, but not their ways. They still put economic development over human health and the environment. The EPA External Civil Rights Office accepted that is investigating a civil rights complaint against Eagle. We're not doing any enforcement against DPI despite over a decade of air complaints. They also are investigating Eagle for approving a permit to expand strip rapid packaging next to Kalamazoo's African American Environmental Justice Community, aka the North Side, without considering the cumulative impacts of current rapid packaging and wastewater treatment that existing toxic air pollution that will be exacerbated by the GPI's increase in toxic emissions. The ECC is supposed to make recommendations to the City of Kalamazoo, not dismiss residents' concerns on air quality. The Elder Task Force underplays the dangers of air pollution. How about changing the name to Toxic Air Pollution Task Force and actually helping Kalamazoo's EJ community? The ECC should make a recommendation that the City Wastewater Treatment Plant fix the junction chamber ASAP. I saw in some meeting minutes that they held off on fixing that in 2021 to let DPI finish construction on their expansion, but the emissions are still leaking out of that chamber and putting human health at risk. I also think the ECC should recommend the city fund relocation and as a minimum, asthma meds for the uninsured in the Northeast side and air monitoring that could detect all toxic pollutants both plants release on a daily basis by a third party not involved in the cover-up. Commissioner Hoffman just admitted at Monday's city meeting that she has been sick ever since she moved to the north side in 2018 and doesn't need a health report to tell her she is suffering health effects from environmental pollution. I agree. I think the city will hopefully take your recommendations more seriously now that they know one of their own is sick. I am a non-smoker and I was on three inhalers two asthma meds, a nebulizer, and eye drops for burning eyes from the toxic gas leaks when I lived on the north side. I moved as soon as I found out risk to myself and my family's health. I now only have one asthma medication and one inhaler. Improved relocation will be effective to protect the residents from further dangerous impacts to their health from the toxic air pollution. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for calling in tonight. Do we have any other callers? Okay. okay. And do we have any comments uh, from anybody in the live audience? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a comment or a suggestion. Uh, I'm yeah. Jack Urban, the former uh, city commissioner, uh, and I was I was uh, listening to uh, uh, Director Baker uh, uh, his presentation last Monday night. Is that going to be Is that going to be helpful? Uh, and uh, uh, we have to remember that Director Baker is an engineer. And he follows regulations, but he's not a toxicologist. Uh, but uh, whenever he's mentioning uh, levels uh, of pollutants uh, in the air, uh, he lets you know what they are in reference to uh, some toxic limits, uh, which may be 
I think they're cute. Uh, double um, set limits. The one for chronic exposure or for you know continuous exposure for several weeks. None of that reaches the public. If I seriously if they're understanding that. So uh, it would really be helpful if the ECC would would help uh, the, the city uh, put the data that he, Mr. Baker is presenting into a context so that people know exactly, uh, or at least not exactly, but much more clearly what the relative risk is. Uh, uh, you can always find a peak that, that, that is alarming. But what's really important, as all of you know who are interested in involved in toxicology is the area under the curve that is what really creates the, the hazard over time. And so I would like that to be explained better. And you as a committee, uh, I think, could, could uh, underwrite such an effort or do it yourself or ask for someone to help you prepare some um, materials, graphical, hopefully that would uh, help explain this to the public. You need to do some education besides just present the data. That's my bottom line. And uh, I wish you well on it, and I'm glad to help in any way I can. All right. Yeah, thanks so much. Anybody else? Comments? Please name. All right. All right, moving on uh, to unfinished business. Um, uh, we're going to kind of leave on our agenda uh, the Community uh, Sustainability Plan um, and keep talking about it every week, hopefully keep the ball uh, rolling on that. Um, Jamie McCarthy from the City Planner's Office uh, should be to our meeting next month to give us an update. She did send a long uh, email update um, that I shared with all of you. Um, I'm not going to go over all. There was so much stuff in that email, um, and I'm going to end up describing some of it incorrectly. Uh, uh, to go over such kind of a long thing. But there are quite a few items that the city is currently working on um, with the sustainability plan um, while they're while they're waiting for uh, while they're waiting to get the job description of the job posted here um, at the beginning of the year and then interview and then and then finally hire to get somebody um, in to help coordinate all of that. Just a quick note on that the we don't know that the job will be posted in January. There, it's part of the new budget uh, that they have to come up with, which means that at the soonest, it'll probably be February or March that they get the job posted, and it'll be even months and weeks afterwards where, until they get the staff level job, which is not the recommendation that we made to the city commission in June. Our recommendation was to create a director level position, and I think uh, the fact that it's now going through the normal budget process presents an opportunity for the commission to reconsider um, our recommendations or consider them because so far I haven't seen any movement on our recommendations. So. All right. Uh, and again, I'm also going to leave uh, Marl Lake, Marl Lake Dam cleanup and Kalamazoo River issues. Um, do we have any, uh, does anybody have any update on that? I haven't heard um, anything um, about that. Like I said last month, um, legislation in uh, the House and Senate, uh, the Senate especially, uh, looking at a, a polluter pay uh, bill or so-called polluter pay bill, it uh, sounds like it's going nowhere um, right now, although there is current litigation in the Attorney General's office mm -hmm. specific to um, uh, the Morrow Lake uh, disaster. Does anyone know, I read that Consumers Power is now affiliated yeah. with Consumers Energy. Mm -hmm. They purchased it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. When did that go through? A long time ago, kind of. Okay. I think like around six months ago, but don't quote me. Okay. You can find some articles about that. Okay. Last year. Right. Yeah, I had not heard. I knew that it had been sold, but I didn't realize it was just consumers that had so I wonder if they're now involved with with the cleanup or with the Attorney General's office. Hmm. It doesn't mean Michigan taxpayers are putting the bill for an out of state and out of country right, right, right. that sold it. To All right. Anything else on um, the river issues? All right, so we do have uh, quite a few guests. 
uh, tonight. So we've got Director Baker here. Thanks for coming. Um, talk to us about flooding mitigation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen here. Yeah, we got it set mm -hmm. up so folks at home can see what we can see. Yeah. We'll call it right up in there. Okay, I think it's working great. So, um, you know, thank you everybody for having me. I'd like to thank the ECC for uh, giving me this opportunity to present and talk about some uh, flood mitigation strategies that, that we're working on. My name is James Baker. I'm the City Kalamazoo Public Services Director and City Engineer. So I've got uh, just a few slides tonight. I figure we go through some discussion on a, a number of topics and then we can get into, you know, some, some further engagement on some items. So we did want to talk tonight about uh, flood locations and types, scope and magnitude of flood events, current and recent projects. So this is some of the work that we've been doing and, you know, kind of leading up to some larger flood mitigation alternatives. And then we'll go into some details on those. So flood locations and types, I did want to spend a little bit of time here uh, just for some understanding on there's different ways that we can experience a flood event. And for folks that are currently experiencing that, this may all just be arbitrary and might not matter to them if they're standing in water and they have, you know, damage to their property and everything else. So um, sometimes that can be very frustrating. But in terms of solutions and how we work to solve those problems, it is very important that we look to identify what type of flooding we're experiencing because that may impact the type of solution uh, that we're going to apply to it. And so I've selected just a series of common flood event type scenarios that we would experience here in Kalamazoo, and I'll just kind of talk through them. Um, so the first one up there is non-riverine urban flooding, and this is a newly recognized category by FEMA uh, that's pretty recent. And, you know, generally what this means is that there's a rainfall event with a certain intensity, duration, and location that overwhelms an urban storm sewer system, and it causes flooding to streets, to homes, or properties, just like a, a flood of, uh, you know, a river or something else. Mm -hmm. um, although some specifics in that it generally occurs outside of a floodplain and it generally occurs independent of any kind of river flood event. And so some recent examples of where this has occurred, uh, we saw this in the east side uh, around the Detroit area when mm -hmm. there's a tremendous amount of, of rainfall and you saw highways that were, you know, kind of submerged and cars stuck and everything else. We also experienced this in Kalamazoo. We've had a few um, acute locations where this has happened, where we've had very intense storm systems that have overwhelmed the storm sewer system. Uh, we've had flooding damage, but it was outside of the floodplain. It was not um, in respect to river elevation flooding. The ne next one down there, river flooding, uh, that's a pretty simplistic in its definition. Essentially, we've got a river or a stream um, system that is adjacent to a floodplain, and you achieve a certain threshold uh, stage or bank level, and then you experience water from the rivers, you know, over bank and then into floodplains and flood zones. This happens throughout Kalamazoo in our defined floodplains. Another kind of unique uh, flooding scenario happens in Kalamazoo, referred to as non-tidal backwater flooding. And so what happens, this is essentially where um, in ocean communities, when the tide comes up, it comes up high enough to flush, to push flooding into the surrounding communities. So certainly we don't have any oceans in Kalamazoo, but we do have a unique uh, river system where during flood stage, Kalamazoo River is higher than Portage Creek. So the Crosstown Ponds sit at a bank full elevation of approximately 758. Kalamazoo River during flood stage is 760 and above. So during a textbook flood of nine foot, Kalamazoo River is two foot higher than the Crosstown Pond. And it will begin to back up and surge mm -hmm. back up following the Portage Creek floodplain. And then it becomes kind of this time duration uh, event to where you've got you know capacity. It's a, a dynamic equation between capacity flow rate and time, right? And so if we stayed at nine foot forever, 
we would flood all of Cross Town Pond, all of the Porch Creek floodplain, and all the Kalamazoo River floodplain. We stayed there a little bit of time, then the flooding was less. The flow was up higher, 11 feet, 11.69 feet, our record flood from 2018, then we can back flood those areas as well. River Rhine flooding also refers to Portage Creek, just the channel capacity deficiencies that exist there. So you could have a flood event where it's overwhelming that. Another item that we wanted to highlight is groundwater infiltration. So groundwater infiltration is something that we're gonna be talking about and we'll have it on the slides, but it's something independent of, of flooding. You know, we recognize that folks are experiencing challenges and damage to their property from groundwater, but that's something that not that Flooding programs don't necessarily deal with, um, and there's also the acknowledgement that a flood event can involve all of these scenarios all at the same time. So, what does a flood look like in Kalamazoo? Um, just to give you some understanding of the of the Kalamazoo River as it enters the city of Kalamazoo, and when it shows up on our doorstep, it's got a thousand square miles of watershed above us. So that flow that's generated, that time of concentration in that river system is all upstream from us. And certainly there's impact that Kalamazoo has locally, but a lot of that stuff is already on its way here, so to speak. Um, a typical flood event for Kalamazoo could put us in the 15 to 20 billion gallons of, of water in addition to what we have on deck, so to speak, right now. So when we start talking about flood solutions and we start you know, kind of lining out the script of what do we want to do to improve that, We've, we're talking about some pretty significant um, large in scope to deal with that kind of water. Uh, speaking specifically to channel capacities, uh, the river channel through Kalamazoo is insufficient to handle flood volumes. So if we get flows into the city in flood stage, I'm talking 7,000 CFS flows and above, we're not gonna be able to handle them. We're gonna go into a flood scenario. Low-lying areas around Portage Creek will fill with water, uh, backwater. So I'm kind of presenting mechanisms of, of failure, if you will, that will happen in response to those kind of flood scenarios that I talked about, backwater flooding. So we talked about non-tidal backwater flooding, and during a flood, we experience that when the Kalamazoo River goes up to flood, and then we get all this water that comes into the Portage Creek watershed, floods across down ponds and those surrounding areas. Uh, we also have high groundwater elevations that contribute to chronic basement flooding uh, in, you know, perhaps older homes in, in low-lying areas. So looking specifically at, at groundwater infiltration, and, and this can happen independent of a flood event. It can also happen simultaneously to a flood event. So we've got high groundwater elevation. So the red areas that you see there are groundwater elevations that are two foot or less below the ground surface. So if you dug a hole in one of those red shaded areas, you could theoretically hit the water table within two foot or less. Um, if you have a home with a basement in one of those areas, you may need sump pumps to keep up with that water infiltration rate. Uh, your, the way your foundation, the, the structure and construction methods of the home, uh, as well as the age may influence basement water infiltration rate. So you could have two homes that have the same depth of basement. One home may get more water than the other home, and that just comes back to construction means and methods of material types. Mm -hmm. uh, this is quite often an individual property and citizen level resource need. Um, so there's not generally large programs that are going to go after and you know, suck down all that red area and make that so where uh, groundwater is infiltrated in, in the homes. Um, and, and this is something that can be extremely frustrating uh, for folks, one, to understand what's happening um, when you're not during a flood event, but yet you're still getting a flooded basement mm -hmm. and, you know, where some of these things can, can occur. So I've got some links embedded within the slideshow. I'm not going to go to them all during our conversation, but um, this slideshow will be available for everybody and what this that link does, that's actually at Stockbridge. Uh, we've got a live USGA, USGS gauge at Stockbridge that measures the depth from the surface where the grass is down to where the current water table is at. Um, and you can, once you get into there, you can chart it over time. You can go back 30 years and see what's been going on or you can look at it um, kind of in real time. 
getting back to kind of these typical flood um, event parameters, you know, we're talking about uh, what is often seen as a one-two punch in Kalamazoo, where we've got the actual rain event. You're experiencing kind of curb flooding and everything else. Portage Creek comes up and floods. Then there's this calm kind of sunny day time period. And then the Kalamazoo River then develops into flood stage and then backwater floods everything else. A lot of that has to do with the time of concentration or the time it takes the flood flow to develop. Um, that's uh, in relationship to the size of the watershed. So the Portage Creek has, you know, uh, 100 miles or less, square miles or less watershed above it. Its time of concentration is much smaller than 1,000 square miles of the Kalamazoo River. But when we have significant rain events, storm events, we're going to see reaction out of Portage Creek much quicker than we see a reaction out of Kalamazoo River. And so we're going to see those flood flows hit us from Portage Creek first before we see the flood flows um, hit us from Kalamazoo River. Now, some of that is due to urbanization. There's some of that is due to runoff coefficients and everything else uh, due to our kind of built environment that we live in today. I did want to highlight, however, that prior to development, going all the way back to the floods of 1866 and 1867, uh, those floods were of greater magnitude than any recent flooding, including the 2018 and 1947 floods. Now, you can look at it and say, hey, wait a minute, James, you know, Kalamazoo was a city in 1866. There was development, we had roads, you know, we can show you a map of what that looked like. Um, yes, we understand that. However, if you look at uh, the urban sprawl, there was not a shopping mall in the city of Portage in 1866. Um, if you go up West Main, uh, Restaurant Row and all the commercialization that's happened up there did not occur in 1866. So all those surrounding areas were still agriculture and woodlands, and we still experienced a very significant, um, arguably could be a 500 year flood in those two events. Just one second, James. Yes, sir. But that doesn't take into account the damage and the spread of that water. You know, it's like the floods in the, in the Mississippi River, some of the most uh, destructive ones that we've had in the last couple of decades, failed in comparison to historic floods in terms of volume of water, but that volume of water stays within the watershed, um, the wetlands, and the river system without flowing into the development. Yes, 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 sir. Totally correct. So um, that's a very valid point. You know, it goes into some of the, the humanistic aspects of the damage and, and you know, um, problems that it creates. So it, my uh, attempt at that was just to kind of understand just the flow characteristics. Separate. I think that's that's like step two is going into those next level, you know, damage assessments and, and all that risk that happens when, when we develop those areas. So talking about just some current and recent projects, um, we started back in, in early 2019. This was in response to the, the big 2018 flood. We uh, got a, a joint work group together uh, consisting of USGS, let's see, uh, the United States Geological Survey, the National Weather Service, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the city of Kalamazoo. We got together uh, to really study the flow dynamics of what was happening with Kalamazoo River and Portage Creek and that we wanted to work to develop a flood inundation mapping system. And so what that uh, work in included uh, was, a, was a lot of work by all these agencies to kind of get us to a point where we can then move uh, to a project and, and actually start designing and, and imp implementing alternatives. And I'll talk more about these as we go on. I've got kind of like project highlights so we can go in and do some deep dives and look at some of these projects as we go forward. I just wanted to put them up there and kind of introduce what we're going to be talking about. So the flood inundation mapping project, um, we needed some more gauging stations along the uh, system. So we added a uh, USGS gauge station on Portage Creek at Reed Street. Uh, so that has been operational for uh, a number of years now. Uh, we then uh, did a, a survey of the actual underwater sections the profiles of Portage Creek and Kalamazoo River from, uh, you know, essentially all through the city. We worked from the face of Marl Dam through the city all the way up uh, to Mazel on the um, Kalamazoo River. And then we did a survey of Portage Creek throughout the section of the, of the city of Kalamazoo as well. Um, that information was then used to create a two-dimensional hydraulic engineering model of what that river profile looks like. So essentially, you know, we're, the river system 
is our pipe, right? To convey the water. The water is the flow that we receive. And so we needed to see, well, how big is our pipe? Uh, what are the design characteristics of this pipe and, and how can we model it? So that was a lot of work that went into it. Um, I was surprised that we didn't find any cars. I think to my knowledge, there was only like a couple bikes that were found, um, but no cars. So that is uh, unique. Better than an average weekend at Michigan State. There you go. Uh, a quick question about that. So with the Morro Dam sediment piling up along the river, does that change what this map would look like if you were to do it again today? It it does um, if, if you zoom in to some very minute levels. Okay. From a macro standpoint, it had very little impact. Right. Um, and there was some, we did some work to kind of <clears throat> study the, the two scenarios. There, there, there was a large amount of sediment that went in. Um, those, the, that value is being argued, depends which expert you go to, uh, there's different um, reports on what that volume is, uh, but even just taking a high-end estimate of what that volume is, applying it uh, to like a linear model, it it does impact, but not materially impact um, those flows. Another thing too that, uh, this is just an anecdotal observation, is that we are seeing that sediment is moving around a little bit. And so I think in time, that's that's going to look different mm -hmm. um, because that that is moving around. Thank you. Uh, um, just kind of getting back into the the flood mapping project. The goal, the takeaway goal, so two really big takeaway goal here is that once we develop that two D dimensional model, that's going to then accelerate our ability to design and plan and um, seek alternative projects for flood mitigation solutions. Another aspect that we're really focusing on, uh, kind of being able to deliver to citizen level usage is the actual kind of plug-in mapping feature that would that would work with GIS. It would go into a GIS layer and then it would communicate with National Weather Service um, Hydrologic Prediction Center. So essentially what would happen is that we would have uh, this widget kind of built in the GIS and then when we see a, a flood that uh, flood potential is going to come, National Weather Service would show on their uh, their gauge what that river would go to. Hmm. That crest information is kind of calculated through the widget and then it's applied to every single parcel within the floodplain. And so what's up here, this is just a snippet of floodplain maps. You've got the Kalamazoo River that kind of comes into downtown and then turns and goes north. And then you've got Portage Creek that's kind of coming and meandering and hitting uh, it with a confluence. And then You've got the red area is a flood way. That's the area where the water is actually moving during a flood. And then the blue is essentially your 100-year flood zone. And then the kind of grayed out area is our zone X. And that represents the area that's above 100 year and up to a 500 year. And so you could, these are the same floodplain maps that we've had for a while. You can access these through GIS. But they will just kind of show you where your parcel is and then whether or not you're in the flood uh, plane or floodway or you know what that is. It does not tell you the level of inundation on your property. And, and going through the 2018 flood event, you know, we saw this as a, something that where we needed to really improve our ability to communicate to the public of, hey, there's a flood coming. Okay, thanks. What does that mean? Are we talking like two inches of water at my property or are we talking six feet of water at my property? And so we didn't have the ability to tell folks that given the technology we had at the time. So when this system becomes operational, we'll be able to have that. We'll be able to look at every unique parcel and tell you that you'll get two inches of water. You'll get six feet of water. And folks can take things much more serious if they've got that ability that makes them key decisions for their family and their property um, and then re respond and react accordingly. Another pro project that we completed in uh, early, two uh, early 2020 was the Crosstown Pound and Culvert Dredging Project. Uh, where there's a series of ponds that are kind of in line with Extel Creek. Uh, they then outlet via culverts. There's twin underground culverts that flow uh, to a confluence just behind the Youth Development Center with Portage Creek. And then, you know, that way, and then from there it's conveyed to Uh We were experiencing uh, kind of a record number of bank flow and bank overflow flooding responses to what we would consider just kind of average rainfall events. Uh, we put a project together, requested FFV funding, Foundation for Excellence funding, and that project was funded. The project was awarded in 2019. That work occurred all through 2019 and into 2020. Uh, that was a very substantial project. It was over 
uh, over a million dollars, I think $1.5 million in dredging. Uh, and we moved 11,000 cubic yards of material from those culverts. Uh, some anecdotal observations were that uh, the sections of the culverts were, you know, head high full of sand and, and, and grit material. Uh, so once we've completed that project, opened that area back up, uh, we're seeing some positive response from that. So we've got just some trends here that shows you Portage Creek flow kind of spiking up to, you know, around 200 CFS. And, uh, you know, we were able to handle those events that occurred this summer in July. And, you know, we didn't have any street closures in response to those events. So, you know, we were essentially able to see that that was a very positive project for us. Um, and it's helping to kind of restore some design capacity of that system. Another project that, uh, you know, we wanted to highlight that's happening right now is that uh, PCB removal from Kalamazoo River that's at Burbert Park right now. That's going to be, it's in the process of moving north. It's going to move north where they're going to set up at the wastewater treatment plant and they're going to continue to clean sediment from, from the river going north, northward. Um, one of the unique things that, uh, is a question about the, the dam sediment and that's kind of overlaying some of this sediment. So EPA is having to deal with that as well. Um, I, I can't tell you what the end result is going to be in terms of, um, you know, responsible party litigation, all that kind of stuff. But um, the goal is that that sediment's got to come out. They're out there digging it out now. And um, so that's going to help to restore some of that acute flow response in, with, within some of these sectional areas. Another reason why this is important um, is, is going back to any design alternative or solution that you want to have moving forward that may include, and I'm not saying it does, but may include um, stream straightening or widening or anything like that, you would be prevented from doing that if there was, you know, PCB laden sediments in, in place. So cleaning up the river, it, you know, does wonderful things in terms of the environment and everything else and health and safety, but it also opens more doors for us into the future that may not have been there in the past. Another partnership project that uh, we're you know really excited about is the Allied Landfill OU1 Portage Creek reconstruction. So this is part of the overall uh, OU1 consolidation, and you see that uh, the consolidation area is pushed as far west as it can be to kind of open up to just some clear space between where uh, the Portage Creek is, and then that southern section of Portage Creek as it crosses Cork Street and then kind of starts its meander north. That's getting kind of realigned, and then uh, we're going to be constructing seven additional acres of wetland. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us. This um, during the design and planning stages of OU1, we were able to reach out to EPA and say, "Hey, could we reconsider the option to create some wetlands within this project? Uh, you know, wetlands have tremendous environmental benefits, but there's also these." flood benefits that the city would really realize from this. So seven acres doesn't solve all of our problems, but it's incremental goals and incremental steps towards those goals that where we can key in these bank elevations and kind of design it to where this area will begin to flood it around the 200 to 300 CFS area. And so the result, the goal result here is that we'll flood up in this designed wetland and use that capacity before we start flooding areas north of Stockbridge and that have suffered a lot of prolonged flooding. So it doesn't fix everything. Um, it's going to take much more than seven acres to do that, but it is a step in the right direction. Is that historic, the wetland, or is that something? That never existed before. There were yeah. uh, really sharp, uh, it, uh, almost yeah. like ravines, yeah. banks in that, uh, that area right there. So the creek was a very narrow channel and then it had these slopes that went way up uh, back to Cork Street or back to where that uh, previous landfill was. So uh, moving is really uh, there's a lot of things that had to come into place to do this. That consolidation area had to get pushed as far west as possible, like all the way up to nearly the railroad property. Now what that did is it allowed that, you know, consolidation tow to be away from the creek then allowed us to lower where these upland areas were so that we can then spread the creek out and create those those wetland features. So this is never uh, never been uh, there before wetlands. You know they didn't previously exist. So this is a total new creation. Uh, 
Um, getting into downriver Ryan urban flooding, there was uh, some some storm events that happened last year in in July. We we experienced 4.26 inches of rainfall that fell over uh, just the wee hours of of a Friday night into Saturday morning. Uh, we had a, a number of homes and, and streets in Northside that experienced an inundation event in response to that. Um, and so one of the projects that we're doing is we're coming out and making um, improvements to storm sewer structures. Uh, to increase capacity during peak events. And it's important to highlight that the solution has got to fit the flooding scenario or type. So we would not be successful if we went into some of those floodplain areas and increased storm sewer capacity because we're still going to flood. Um, in those low-lying areas, that storm sewer is essentially a hole in the dam. It's a straw through the line, so to speak, that when the river's low, the storm flow is conveyed in that direction. When the river is high, that same stormwater pipe then becomes a conduit to allow the flows back in. So you really have to be above floodplain to have these projects work in terms of capacity increase. Um, so each unique flood situation has a equally unique solution that can be applied to it. And we can't apply solutions in one area to another and expect success. So getting into some flood mitigation strategies. So I think last time we met, I was here last year, Aaron, mm -hmm. was that correct? Mm -hmm. We talked about some concepts that we wanted to pursue further and kind of the next step would be, let's, we had to get them in the Kamloops County hazard mitigation plan. So we're, that was successful. So that's, that's great news to announce that um, so our flood mitigation plans, we've got two of them that are now in the county hazard mitigation plan. Um, so that's the uh, the big uh, Portage Creek flood bypass plan, and then uh, what we call North Kalamazoo storm uh, relief sewer plan. So to go in and talk about, and the link is there that will take you to the, again, the links are in the presentation and, and folks can and go visit stuff um, on their own to see some, go into some further dives. So the Portage Creek flood control project, this is in the hazard mitigation plan. Uh, the project goal seeks to uh, essentially remove the floodplain from that gray area. So that grayed out area represents a flood situation um, and that aligns with the, the floodplain area. The goal of this project would be to make that go away. So all those structures in red can stay and not experience flooding in the future and the you know community can kind of retake their land and uh, use it for all the wonderful, great things uh, cities do. And so to describe the project, uh, really we're looking at Portage Creek. And when we get into high flow events, we would intercept that, drop that into a tunnel. The tunnel would convey that flow over somewhere near Mayor's Riverfront Park. It would go to like about a 300 million gallon per day lift station that would lift that up back into Kalamazoo River then the main creek would have a smaller, approximately 100 million gallon per day um, stream lift station that would lift that up um, into the uh, Kalamazoo River. So um, in terms of CFS, usually in large channels, we measure like with river flow, we measure in CFS, not in, in million gallons or something like that. So I was just kind of giving you some relationship between the flow. So the CFS is a cubic foot per second. So we're saying, we would need to pump 600 cubic feet per second uh, from that tunnel up into the, the Kalamazoo River. So this is kind of what I described. That red line would be uh, a tunnel that's, you know, well below. This isn't like a buried pipe. This would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 feet or so below ground. Uh, you'd have a, a tunnel boring machine that would come set up and drill its tunnel all the way through that corridor. Um, then to where that lift station is at. And then from there, the, those flows would stabilize and then we'd get uh, pumped up over like with a low head pump in, into the Kalamazoo River. So this stuff sounds all like really far out. Um, but, you know, the good news is that, you know, we think this is a feasible project. Uh, we've got this project now at Army Corps Engineers. They're doing a technical uh, evaluation. They're providing technical assistance to see if 
and the big question I hear is that couldn't we do this project, eliminate that floodplain area that we showed in gray, and not materially impact flooding in other areas? Mm -hmm. And that's what would define project success. So if through the Army Corps engineer research, it's determined that this is increasing flooding in other areas, this project alternative would not be considered valid. Um, so that's kind of, it is very complex. You know, we're essentially saying that um, we're not going to mess with the floodplain of Kalamazoo River. We're just not allowing Kalamazoo River to take the floodplain of Portage Creek. And that's kind of, uh, you know, making the Kalamazoo River convey its flows downstream. Interesting, when you look at the channel gradients, as soon as the Kalamazoo River turns north, it drops grade and it starts really chugging along. Mm -hmm. So there is some potential that if we could get our inputs into the right spot, that we could have a net zero effect on any other flooding in other areas. So once you get up to Patterson Street Bridge, I mean, the flow is rocking. You get up to Mazel, it's rocking and rolling and it goes. Um, so it's just a matter of the channel is really just insufficient as it's making that turn to head north in, in Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. There's also some tremendous funding needs. This project, when we first priced it out, um, before we really started experiencing a lot of COVID price um, changes, you know, we were in the 100 to $120 million ballpark. Um, it's published in the report in the hazard mitigation plan as a $110 million project. I would just, you know, kind of uh, give an asterisk that that's a very just preliminary estimate on um, before going into a real detailed design. Um, so there's some, definitely some funding needs there. Another concern is environmental consideration. So the way projects kind of evolve in, in all directions, you know, you kind of start with a concept, you've got to technically prove it, and you kind of move out from there. And as you move out from there, you're picking up a whole bunch of other areas, including, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to transport fish? How are we going to protect against, um, you know, we don't want things to go down into this tunnel and then get pumped that back up into the river. And so there's mechanisms to help deal with that, but there are costs at some point, you know, either direct costs back to the project or uh, an environmental cost of, you know, there, there may be some limitation of, uh, you know, there could be tree removals, there could be other things. I don't fully know what that is. I just know enough to say, if we're going to do a project this big, we need to, at the ground floor, understand that there's going to be environmental considerations that we're going to have to come to the table on and understand up front before we get to the back end. Because I think that's potentially very frustrating for the community if we went through the full design, got the funding ready to go, and then, oh, we've got this environmental issue that we haven't brought out and talked about. We've got to have that on the front end. I have one quick question. Uh, I don't know much about water, but I know it's heavy and energy intensive to move around. Yeah. And uh, during a flooding event, there's often power outages. So I'm curious uh, that pumping those lift stations that bring the water up into the Kalamazoo River, are those like independently powered or off the grid or something? And I'm just wondering like what would happen if power went out on those facilities during a flooding event? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very great question. And so um, all these, we call critical infrastructure facilities, uh, so just like Central Wellfield or Wastewater Treatment Plant, uh, most of our critical infrastructure utilities has what we call dual source power. Mm -hmm. So we've got power from not just one source, but we've got another source. And that could include dual line power from separate substations. In this location, you could have, say, the Cooley as one branch circuit, and then you could have, you know, potentially, you know, Riverview as a second branch circuit. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, as we kind of go down that funnel of, criticality, there, there does become a time where we need that to be just independently powered. And that could be some on-site um, generator that would have to then power that under a total emergency situation. Mm -hmm. So that we don't have that um, defined out yet, but we well, we have defined that it would need redundant sources of power. Gotcha. <clears throat> So the next project to talk about that's another big large scale project is the Northside Stormwater Relief Project. So virtually 
the entire north side neighborhood and then some portions of other neighborhoods are actually out of the floodplain. So north side is not in the floodplain. If you turn the floodplain layer, layer on, the majority of the north side neighborhood is not in the floodplain. The wastewater treatment plant technically is in the north side neighborhood and there are portions of it that are in the flood floodplain. So I'm not trying to put myself on a 100% island and say, you know, uh, for sure this or that. I'm just, you know, referencing the area that we've shown here in the map is not in the floodplain. So what does that mean? During a flood event, the north side is not underwater. And there's some opportunities here. That means that we can convey that flow um, by increasing pipe size. So this, you know, really set, short of cost and cost can be challenges, but this is a project that essentially can be done without the major hurdles that we may have on some other projects. So it's a function of cost and uh, pipe size and select and everything else. So what we've shown here, those red spots and the red lines and the yellow highlighted circles, those are locations of storm sewer capacity, defi capacity deficiency. So under certain duration, intensity, and location storm events, and we can categorize each one of those, like a one-year storm or a five-year storm or a 10-year storm or 25-year storm, we're saying that those areas of pipe will not convey flows. And then when you see like the yellow circle, we're saying that that's where you start to have some ponding that would occur at a road, you know, at the roadway surface or above in response to a rate of that. So, in, the, in other words, plain plain English, where the yellow spots are, folks would see flooding. This is not a floodplain, so this is this is that urban uh, non-urban flooding event uh, that would happen. And we can solve this. This can be solved through engineering. Mr. Baker? Yes, sir. Can I get you? To, I'm, I'm really sorry. Can I get you to go back to that last minute you were just on? I'm thinking about the big pipe project there. Yeah. Uh, so this is going to be 120 million minimum, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. And plus maintenance and plus operation for time immemorial. Has there been any consideration of increasing green space and buying out some of the property owners, which would probably cost less than 120 million dollars, and it would capture carbon and free us up from having to power those pumps? Um, um, you know, consistently. No, I think that's that's a very valid option. I think that's something that um, you know we've we've identified that in the in the plan. Uh, we went a different direction with it, and we kind of recognize that this is an urban core community. We're well in urban area, and that folks that that live there want to stay there. There's businesses that want to be there and function as a city, and we move forward with the project plan. That's not to say that that's not a very valid alternative because it can be. Um, there are there are programs in place that um, could look to achieve those goals, and you know you would essentially have a big pocket green space into the future if you were able to be successful with it. Um, one of the challenges that we saw as we kind of worked through to iterate a program like that was that uh, even with federal funding or hazard mitigation, relocation assistance program that would do just that. It would buy the home and then uh, funds would then be provided to the homeowner and then uh, the area's got to be returned to green space. One of the challenges with that is that you know, federally, they would only fund up to 50% of the assessed property value. Uh, you know, we're seeing that assessed property value might not provide the true cost to really relocate somebody. Uh, we're also seeing that there are a fair amount of rental properties where the owner and the person we would deal with may be, may benefit, but the person living there may be a runner and they may be out. So that I think there's just probably more work that needs to be get done to try to better understand some of those complexities of attempting to do something like that. But I think there's still that option, and you know we're not committed funding wise into this. It's just one of these alternatives that we've considered and you know we're presenting. How much of that hundred and twenty million is would be expected as like the city's versus federal money that would be so I mean it's all on the table. If the city had hundred and twenty million dollars today, we could start permitting, right? Um, I think it's anytime the city's looking to do a major project, we're always looking to see, you know, what how can we max funds to bring in to help the community? You know, in just to reference drinking water, you know, real quick. 
we're doing a tremendous amount of capital investment in drinking water. Lead services is very, very popular. Uh, we just received an award from Eagle for $15.15 million to continue our lead service replacement program into 2023. So that's, that's a huge win. It's just some state funding dollars. Uh, we've also submitted a, a notice to apply funding application for future projects for 2024 and beyond to Eagle for drinking water projects of over $129 million. So we're out, we're asking for dollars. Uh, we're going to all the sources that we can. And, um, you know, sometimes we don't know, you know, I don't know sitting here today what future options may be available. I think, um, you know, really this, the project can't go forward until Army Corps Engineers gives us a thumbs up on that technical assistance. What's the timeline on that? We would we would really like to have an answer within within a year. Um, understanding that there there could be things that jump in front of that, and there could be times where we get an answer, but then we go back to the table. We get an answer, we go back to the table. So uh, this work is just starting. Uh, that handoff of the model from USGS to Army Corps engineers was happening literally last week. Of you know, it's a very large file, and they're in their agency talking about you know how can they move files back and forth, and and so that handoff is just now occurring. So I imagine you know make some progress with it over the over the winter, but we'd still probably like to allow about a year for for that to, to fully occur. To basically answer the question is is it feasible without causing flooding downriver? Correct. Right. Correct. That doesn't mean it's permitted. There's a whole other series right. of that's just permitting and everything else. Can we go try to do that? Can we go try to do right. it? Right. And then in perspective of, okay, let's design it and then be ready, right? A project of this scope, we're looking at uh, design costs in the neighborhood of $10 million, $10, $12 million. And so that's something that's very substantial. Um, and Another point is that here in Kalamazoo, we do not have a stormwater utility. So stormwater is a function of kind of major and local streets. Mm -hmm. There's also some general fund dollars that go towards it. But uh, just to be honest, we do not have 10 to $12 million in any one of those funds to be able to do it aside. So that would have, that's all, the funding need is real. There's yeah. just a tremendous need for funding. Jumping back into the north side, um, again, the, the yellow circles, the red dots are, you know, essentially modeled flood areas under specific storm events. We can solve this with pipe. There's like, in this report, and this is referenced as the Patterson report, uh, there's a, at least five alternatives of different pipe, you know, make these pipes bigger here, run the flow there, make those pipes bigger there, run the flow there. And you could probably um, iterate through and create at least 10 more alternatives to that. So I think uh, we've stopped there understanding that the rivers, you know, to the east, we've got to convey flow there. Uh, there's some things in the way of that. And, you know, how do we solve that problem? So that's one that, uh, you know, at the time we estimated at $20 million, does those costs have you know, certainly gone up. Um, and then scope is one of those things too that, you know, if you def you've got to define where you what your limits are going to be. And quite oftentimes with projects, large scale projects, is that we'll extend limits as we get into the design. If we see that we can be successful with something, why stop it? Why draw the line and stop it if you can go a little bit further and solve more problems? So uh, the cost with that one is published as 20 million, but I would just pause and, and recognize that there's it's a very preliminary number. So again, just to kind of uh, wrap up some next steps, uh, we just kind of continue to seek community support for both stormwater and flood control projects. And you know, as we saw just through our discussion today, there's just there's a lot of options for a lot of these scenarios. Uh, we are, you know, at a standstill with those, that big project until we get some Army Corps engineer determination, uh, and then we also have funding, and we need to really quantify some environmental concerns and seek to implement uh, some projects. And then, you know, we're always looking to develop long-term strategy for sustainable stormwater and, uh, you know, a flood control utility. So again, just that plug for stormwater really isn't a standalone funded enterprise. It's something that kind of exists under 
major streets and local streets and uh, the overall general function of the government. That's it. That's what I've got. So I'm happy to take uh, any questions or um, dialogue. Um, would the the large scale the Portage Creek flood control project uh, impact the Lakewood neighborhood frequent you know, flooding in the Lakewood neighborhood? It would not directly solve the Lakewood neighborhood, um, but it would be our determination that you know we couldn't make that worse. That being said, I think if you go forward with a project of this scale, there's certainly some opportunity for local partnerships. So there would probably be an opportunity to approach Kalamazoo Township and to see, you know, hey, we've got this model built, this is our solution, we think it's technically feasible. Can we look at, you know, showing up some T walls or some flood walls in your area so that we can solve that problem too? And, you know, I think, you know, just quite honestly, if we we're going to move forward with a $100 million scale project, we would very likely want to get some partnerships with the surrounding townships. And if there is the ability to solve it, um, we should we should look at that. And, th and that was one of the things as we looked at this alternative is that we saw like from the face of the dam all the way up to like D Avenue, that was too, that's too big of a project. We were not going to be successful in attempting, you know, to go after all of that. So we had a narrow scope to something that was feasible. And when you do that, you do leave some folks out. And then I think we, you know, we are recognizing that. Um, that look to solve a specific problem, but if we get through that, uh, we probably do need to circle back and say, hey, are there some things, you know, right next door that we could look to, to solve? And, and so we are looking at that. Um, question about the dredging project that happened. Um, was that planned as a, I guess, how long the term of a planned solution was that? Is that going to make it be okay for 30 years, five years? Will that, is planned dredging needing to be continued to Successful you know, we're going to monitor it. We don't really know what the interval, what the best interval should be. Uh, we know uh, we're seeing great performance out of it right now. We're going to continue to monitor it. There's been there's been some anecdotal knowledge, I think, within the department that at some point, I don't know when, 30, 40 years ago, city crews used to do that work from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly for us to do that work today, that's stuff, something that we plan out and permit. You know, we didn't go into the details, but you know, we had to get. 301 permits and um, floodplain permits and all that kind of stuff to do that work. Uh, so I think we're just going to, you know, continue to monitor that. We don't have a defined interval right now, but it is something that um, I think we've realized that is going to come back at some point. It's not done. It's not going to stay gone forever because there is sediment that's actively back going back in there right now. Um, another question about flood maps. I don't think you mentioned it. Um, you're basing certain maps off of 50 year or 100 year 500 year flood how often does that process change and is there a consideration of that maybe getting worse in the future as far as being able to plan properly so that's a great question i, I think there's a lot of opportunities for discussion here first of all when we say you know like a 50 year or 100 year event we're what we're categorizing is um you know like statistical return interval percent interval so a 100 year event is a 1% annual occurrence chance. So that means every single year, there's a 1% chance that we could experience a flood of that magnitude. So the actual magnitude flood events are based off CFS flows of the surrounding you know, watershed. And so for Kalamazoo River, we're targeting somewhere around a 7,000 CFS event for that AE zone or, or 100 year overlay. So that 7,000 CFS figure is constantly updated and so that's one of the features of stream gauging. And that's one of the things that we monitor, the folks at USGS monitor that. Um, I can share that, you know, during the study period, Portage Creek was increasing annual peak occurrence event, annual peak exceedance events uh, by a rate of like 13 CFS per year. So we were seeing that Portage Creek was, the flood events of Portage Creek were becoming greater and the frequency was becoming greater. So that's something that is tracked. Mm -hmm. There is data generated on those aspects. Um, another thing that's also done is that anytime there's constru permitted construction within the floodplain, uh, the entire new floodplain map is created. And that's created under first a LOMAR, a letter of map revision. Um, that all has to be permitted through uh, both the state, through EGLE, um, also with the um, uh, FEMA as well. And then 
there's time intervals and it can be five or 10 years, but there's certain time intervals where FEMA will then look at a certain area. They'll look at all their outstanding LOMARs and then they'll bring all the LOMARs back together and they'll go out and they'll do a new topographic study in a, in a new flood area. So that work is actually occurring in Kalamazoo right now that started in 2018. In fact, the map snippet I have is actually a work group map from some of that uh, the, the reclassification. I have a bunch more questions, but we have our other guests as well. So my, I'll conclude with, uh, if you haven't already, can you send the presentation to Eric? Yeah, 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 I'll yeah, do that. Yeah, we'll, yep. uh, thank you. Okay, but any other, any other questions about uh, flooding mitigation? I wish I could give you a blank check. All right, well, I'm gonna step out and I will join the audience. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for uh, coming to talk to us tonight, Director Baker. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, we can move on to our next uh, agenda item of uh, uh, discussing uh, air quality and you know, most likely uh, the uh, recent uh, drone study uh, with our uh, representatives from Eagle. So if you guys want to kind of come, if you guys can kind of slide up here and Mm -hmm. Join us at the table. That would be awesome. We've got enough room for everybody here. Yeah. Might be able to change this if you hover over in those little dots. Uh, or a spotlight. Sorry. There we go. We're <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself uh, for our reporting secretary. Sure, I'm Chris Etheridge, the uh, Assistant Division Director for Air Quality Division. Rex Lane, I am the District Supervisor for Air Quality Division of the District mm -hmm. Office. Hi, I'm Jill Greenberg. I'm a spokesperson for Eagle, primarily handling air um, remediation issues. Okay. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the um, drone study and, and where you're at with analysis of that and uh, communication that you've had with uh, Kalamazoo Water Reclamation Plant and uh, sort of ongoing um, reporting that you might be receiving from uh, Graphic Packaging International, too? Sure, I can start. Um, and I don't know if it's maybe it would be helpful to kind of give a little more background of everything else we've been working on related to this. So, um, graphic packaging is a facility that we regulate um, under the Clean Air Act and our uh, state regulations. Uh, it's a facility that we've been inspecting for many years, and we've been getting numerous complaints um, from the community around the facility for um, probably over a decade now. So um, Rex and his team have been inspecting the facility, following up on nuisance complaints, um, and then also inspecting inside the facility their equipment, their air permits, all that sort of stuff to determine compliance. Um, so under our state regs, we have a uh, odor nuisance regulation that we can enforce. Um, it's called Rule 901. And that's the main rule that we use to enforce for nuisance odors when we get complaints. So as a result of um, these complaints we've been receiving, uh, we were able to verify uh, several violations of Rule 901 coming from graphic packaging. And so um, over the years, we've cited several times at the facility when we have a situation where we have multiple violations coming from a facility, we have the option to take what we call escalated enforcement. So we chose to do that with this facility Escalated enforcement basically means that we're going to be negotiating um, settlements or court documents with legally binding uh, terms and requirements in the ACO that a facility needs to abide by in order to resolve the violation. So we've been negotiating that for um, at least a couple years now. Three years. Three years. And there's been uh, numerous um, reiterations on the nuisance minimization plan that the company needs to put in place to resolve those 901s. Rex and his team, along with our enforcement group, have been negotiating that. Um, let's 
separately, you know, we've gotten a lot of complaints from folks, um, not only about odors, but also with public health concerns. And, you know, of course, that's always a big concern for, for us when we're hearing that. So um, we've decided to um, do a couple different things. First, um, we've had both the city and graphic packaging install Enviro sleep monitors, which are tracking hydrogen sulfide levels um, in the ambient air surrounding those facilities. Mm -hmm. they, they've done, um, both the company and the, the city have done that. So that's been going on for a couple of years now. Um, and there's been a couple other air monitoring um, efforts that we've taken. Um, both Eagle folks have been out. We did um, a study last year um, with some equipment that we have that measures hydrogen sulfide emissions as well. And we did about, was it about two weeks? Uh, it was actually six weeks. Six at weeks. Two different locations along where the drive. So uh, we did some of our own hydrogen sulfide monitoring as well. We've had EPA come out. Um, they've got a mobile vehicle that they can use to, to measure many different types of pollutants um, in the area. So they coordinated with us, came out with uh, their mobile vehicle and did the mirror monitoring for um, many different pollutants um, as, as part of um, our efforts. But then also importantly, we've been collaborating with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. All the data we've been collecting um, and utilizing their um, expertise and knowledge on the toxicology of, of any of the pollutants that we would be concerned about, um, and then you know any actions that we would need to take based on um, their findings. So we've been working with DHHS for um, probably close to two years now as well. Um, they um, are getting ready to um, finalize and, and send out a what they call health consultation letter. Um, this health consultation letter is going to basically do um, analysis and review of all the monitoring data that's been collected around those facilities. And it's going to provide some recommendations um, of next steps, what else needs to be done. Um, but then also, you know, any kind of outreach um, communications that we need to have with the community about concerns or anything that they found from the data that, you know, we would need to, to consider more or take action on. So in addition to that, um, we have done um, a drone study recently. Um, so the, the drone study is um, something that was, um, it's, it's non-regulatory in nature. And um, it's basically um, utilizing some new equipment that we just received recently um, to be able to analyze um, air emissions. So the drone was um, something that we utilized uh, kind of on a voluntary basis with the city of Kalamazoo wastewater treatment plant. And the drone was actually used on the uh, wastewater treatment plant property, I think both inside and outside their facilities. So took a, a bunch of different measurements um, and there were some indicators from, from what we saw on that drone study that would warrant um, further investigation. We have shared all that drone data um, with uh, HHS as well. Um, but I think the thing that, um, you know, has um, given us um, reason to want to take additional action is the measurement of formaldehyde that we saw from the drone. So we've been um, discussing this both internally and then with DHHS as well. And um, at this point, Eagle is moving forward with an additional study of um, formaldehyde emissions in that same area where we picked up the levels um, on site uh, with the drone. So this is going to, this is going to be a more um, traditional um, methodology that we're going to utilize with uh, some uh, different um, measurement equipment than a drone. We're going to be um, specifically looking at formaldehyde emissions in the community off-site from the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we've also been talking with James and his folks about um, any efforts that the wastewater treatment plant wants to take um, based upon what we saw from the drone study. And of course, they've got some concerns as well. So uh, my understanding is the wastewater treatment plant folks have hired some consultants to look at um, indoor air emissions because they do have some um, concerns with what uh, employee exposure there might be. 
So I believe that they're going to be doing an indoor air study um, and be looking at some of those same pollutants that we picked up during our drone study. Um, I should have brought my bottle of water too. So, um, <laughs> in addition to that, um, my understanding is the wastewater treatment plant is going to be looking at possibilities of what could have caused those spikes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the formaldehyde emissions are um, something that is commonly occurs. There's many different um, potential sources that could have caused the formaldehyde emissions. Um, obviously, it could be something related to the wastewater treatment plant itself, but it could also be related to um, any kind of uh, vehicle emissions. Uh, there were um, tractor traffic in the area at the time we did the, the drone study, um, or it could be from some of the wastewater streams that are coming into the facility as well. So. My understanding is that um, James and his group are going to be looking at those possibilities that kind of assist us on, on problem solving with this one. Yeah, I guess you know, the, the formaldehyde study, um, we would be uh, uh, equipment that's much more sensitive than the sensor platform. We're using for the drone, and uh, we'll have, um, we're looking at a five day, 24 7 type sampling uh, of uh, monitors uh, with, uh, to the west of graphic packaging, east of the city wastewater treatment facility, um, along with a background monitor. Um, we have a air monitoring station at the grounds, and uh, so we'll also uh, utilize uh, uh, a sampler at that location as well. So it'd be over a, a five day period. So those, uh, those results will obviously be shared with the uh, city for the the monitor that's going to be located, you know, near their final solids processing area. Is that study still planning to be taking place next spring? Because my understanding was it was originally this fall and then got moved. Is, is that correct? Um, so this, so we're in the planning stages right now for okay. uh, for Meldehyde, but we're intending to do it yet this fall. Okay. Um, okay. I think you're thinking about the drone study that we yeah, originally okay. talked about. Yeah. Okay. Was, um, initially, we were discussing that for next spring. Okay. And there's been some questions on timing um, related to the drone studies themselves. Are, you know, in con and, and again, keep in mind this was done on a voluntary basis mm -hmm. with Kalamazoo Wastewater Treatment Plants and also with GPI. Mm -hmm. But our thought behind not doing the GPI drone study yet is they were in the middle of an expansion at their facility. And we wanted to be able to do, um, you know, a drone study after the expansion occurred and when we would anticipate there'd be more emissions. Mm -hmm. So um, when we discussed this and then there's some weather issues and concerns with running drones in the middle of the winter. Um, so next spring was what we had agreed upon with, with GPS. Just a, a quick follow up. Um, I'm trying to keep track of some of the things that I uh, have about. The Enviro Suite monitoring, was that something that Eagle uh, suggested or required for GPI in the city to, to implement? Um, so the, the city's um, Enviro Suite system, as I understand it, first started up in the fall of 2019. We initiated our enforcement action in July of 2019. Um, I mean, I, um, in listening in on some of the city commission meetings in the past, you know, there's been a number of comments about the north side odor and, uh, you know, water treatment plant, obviously, which is, of course, the odors, and the packaging is another one, and they're right next to each other. So, um, but the, you know, the city's expanded their Enviro Suite system multiple times. To, I think Recently, I did a couple additional community monitors and uh, graphic packaging uh, has, um, I believe, 16 uh, monitors that basically surround the perimeter.
perimeter of, of, of their operation. And we, uh, when we did our um, hydrogen sulfide monitoring in April and May of 21, we also uh, gathered the EnviroSuite data from both the city and graphic packaging. Um, and that information um, was used to develop an error model. Uh, so we're looking at you know, points of emissions and that sort of helped drive for the experimental drone study. Where did we want to look at emission points? Where did we want to fly the drone to you know, gather data? Uh, so actually we started to visit the city and on uh, May 23rd, 24th. So it, was the city already using that, that platform before um, Eagle started, or well, before it was Eagle, uh, started looking into the, the odor issue? Or was that something that the, that the state suggested or required? Um, that's probably a better question to ask. Uh, the, the County Water Reclamation Plant chose to start using uh, the, the odor monitoring system um, prior to uh, an enforcement action from EGLE. Correct, uh, Director Baker? Uh, the enforcement action uh, with graphic packaging. Yeah, it, yes, if I may. Uh, so yeah. the, uh, the city's entrance into the EnviroSuite platform started in response to an odor task force request. Yeah. The odor task force creation was at the request of the city commission. So there's kind of this, you know, uh, chain, if you will, from city commission requested action to that odor task force and then technical recommendation mm -hmm. for EnviroSuite. We'll say that our initial um, entrance in EnviroSuite was very limited. You know, we entered into that under a pilot um, stage. We didn't really know what the system was or how to utilize it and you know we continue to increase our capacity of how we're using it as well as the capacity in the community so now today we've got 11 monitoring locations 10 of them are active you know there is some we are seeing some maintenance issues where sensors kind of go offline online so we're working through that um, and then we've got six in plant so we've got a whole lot of sensor arrays that are, that are out there and then we're also, in fact, on Monday night's commission meeting, I talked about um, our enhanced capability where you can get on right now and go up to um, operations and hit report, and there's over 45 different trends of different things that you can, you know, each location has like a, a one month, three month, one year mm -hmm. trend, and then if it's been there long enough at all times, they can go back. So you can get in there and play with, what, how you want to see or what you want to see for every single one of these um, trends and everything else. So a um, little bit more of an introduction on EnviroSleep, but I did want to take the opportunity to kind of talk about how, how it is. And we do have more plans to enhance it into the future. So thank you. And But the EnviroSleep monitoring system that uh, is being used by graphic packaging, was that installed under the enforcement action, uh, the enforcement uh, so the ongoing agreement that you're, you know, negotiation with them. They they had kind of kind of a stage thing. They started off with a few, and then they added a few more. Um, we required as part of their air permitting process mm -hmm. to maintain that system okay. at least through the end of, of 2022. Okay. But their intent is to continue to utilize it. And how many of the environmental uh, suites do they have? That they're required to maintain. Um, so they've been adding to it. I believe uh, I'll have to double check my numbers, but I believe they have at least twelve, maybe up towards the six. I think that's right. The last order task force we got together, that I think that was the number that G GPI said mm -hmm. on their property. Can you talk a little bit about the different uh, kinds of data you get on a drone study versus the EnviroSuite monitoring? Is it higher fidelity with the drone suite that you're looking at this five day window or is it, you know, obviously with the EnviroSuite we get like a time series thing, but like um, what's what's the drone bringing to the table and what's the uh, EnviroSuite bringing to the table? Well, um, so with the, you know, again, the, the drone study was experimental. This is a, a brand new platform that we're trying to fly on a, on a heavy lift drone. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we ran into um, 
during those two days was um, it was maybe 45 degrees um, on the days that we were there. We had um, we could only fly for about 15 minutes at a at a time mm -hmm. before we had to drop it down and replace the two batteries mm -hmm. that it runs on. So mm -hmm. we were quickly you know exhausting that capacity. So the next day it brought additional batteries with them so that we could, you know in the air longer. Um, the um, the sensors, there's a total of five. There's a, a VOC, volatile organic compound sensor. We have hydrogen sulfide, we have sulfur dioxide, formaldehyde, and um, nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. um, these sensors have different response times. The VOC sensor is like a three second response time between you know, how long it takes from where the probe is to get a result. Mm -hmm. The other sensors are electrochemical. They have a longer response time. So one of our questions in reviewing the data, um, they run into the other sensors that are anywhere from 30 seconds. To so how fast do you fly the, the, the drone? Because you might see with the VOC thing, well, maybe we're seeing a, a, a slight blip in the numbers. So, but if you keep flying, you, you know, your formaldehyde reading is farther farther down the flight path mm -hmm. uh, that readout. So um, there's questions on, you know, do we need to fly it much slower? Um, you know, that affects the area that you can cover with the, the batteries that you have, depending on the air temperature effect um, you can fly. So um, it, it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we're taking that information as part of this review and we'll refine uh, the next time we fly the drone. Um, I think it's you know, good. I think it's good to kind of just for for a minute when we say experimental, just to kind of explain that a little bit more. So, um, under the Clean Air Act and under our state program, what we typically do as far as evaluation on emissions is we're doing either stock testing um, or we're doing an analysis based upon the materials that they use through our permitting process. So we do. Um, Lots of stack testing at different facilities across the state, and that's one of the main mechanisms that we use to verify whether a facility is in compliance with emission limits. And this is all rooted in methodologies established by EPA um, that you can stand up in court um, that we can use for compliance and enforcement. Using data from a drone where you're not maybe meeting the um, averaging time. You may not be collecting the right type of clue. You may not be using the methodology that's been accepted by EPA and the courts. Um, makes it difficult for us to be able to utilize for any kind of compliance or enforcement. But for graphic packaging, you know, there's um, onerous amounts of stack testing that they do. We, you know, we've even verified non-compliance with some of the stack testing. The drone study is new, it's new technology. I think there's a lot of, you know, experimental with drones these days and a lot of different scientific applications. Kind of something that gives us, like I said before, an indicator that there might be a problem, but it's not the type of data that we can use for violations under our rules or regs. Right. I just wanted to push back on one small thing. I mean, we're talking about a factory next to a residential neighborhood, so I take issue with characterizing it as onerous. It's, it's quite reasonable to uh, monitor the air quality there. I think, I think my main question, um, especially in terms of the future drone study, uh, uh, is more brought to light by the July uh, citations that you guys made uh, based on a surprise um, study. And so the question I have is, once everything's in place, everything you know, you figure out the technology and all that good stuff, and you do the survey with the water treatment plant and graphic packaging, how much notice do they get? before that study takes place. I, I know that unless there's a public health uh, emergency uh, concern, which I think would come out of MDHHS, that you can't do a surprise one. But my concern is that the surprise one is what has revealed uh, violations in the past. So um, how are you accounting for this in your next study plan? Just so I'm clear, when you say the next study, are you talking about the formaldehyde? Study? Either of them. Any any use of uh, any additional studies of the air quality over uh, graphic packaging, but specifically with, with any use of the drone in particular, since it seems to potentially 
show pretty well, good. Well, the, the drone's different because it's voluntary. So we had to negotiate the terms, and, and it's against the law for us to even fly a drone over a facility without their permission. Right, that's state law. So um, we had to develop a contract and get agreement from um, the waste water treatment plant before we could even do the drone study. So that negates any surprise aspect of it. For inspections, complaint investigations, you know, any of those sorts of things where we're doing on-site uh, review for compliance or that's, that's always unannounced. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's mm -hmm. standard procedure for us to do with that. Right? So the formaldehyde study itself, you know, I mean, obviously there's some logistics on us setting up the equipment and getting it at the right spot, mm -hmm. doing all that sort of stuff. We haven't shared the dates with anyone sure. as to when we're going to be doing it. And, you know, we probably won't disclose until after we've set up even the locations of where they're at for obvious reasons. So, we do as much as we can to try to capture real time um, announced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the, the other thing is graphic packaging also has some continuous emission monitors, mm -hmm. um, some of it, but primarily their boilers. Um, and, you know, if, if we have an agreement at a later date with them to do a drone study on their property, um, we would also have access to all of their production data for that, for that, whatever interval of time were there. So we could check that against, you know, information that we've gathered in other unannounced inspections, share those results. That's helpful, thank you. And I, I guess part of my concern too is that, um, you know, like you said, we got two potential source points Two, percent, two regulatory bodies trying to work together, plus the city, plus the county, and everybody else, and us, I suppose. Um, but, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. The, oh, I think my concern is that it's a lot easier to enforce changes on the water treatment plant uh, in the regulatory sense, both because the city government is a function of the state government in, in the state of Michigan. And so my concern is that we're going to be putting a lot more focus on one source point than the other. And so could you talk a little bit more about how you are able to compare these two data sources just in general? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that the wastewater treatment plants are, are sources that we don't typically permit. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the, for obvious reasons, Water Resources Division takes the lead on a lot of the concerns and investigation. And stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's concern, I think, you know, whenever, whenever you get in a situation where you have an odor situation and people are complaining about odors, that there might be fusion emissions or emissions that are unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. And from a wastewater treatment plant, if there's many different potential spots we would need to consider for emissions, mm -hmm. it's actually different than kind of what you were saying. Graphic packaging is easier to be able to diagnose the fact that they're set up with stacks mm -hmm. and ventilation systems done numerous evaluations of permitting and, and have a very good understanding of all the different chemicals and, and materials that they use there. So we've got a good, I think, sense of the different emissions that we would expect in that facility and then an ability to be able to test to show that they're below emission limits. The wastewater treatment plant is different. You don't have stacks. You don't have air pollution control equipment. You don't have dedicated ventilation systems for the most part that like you would see at a, a factory like GPI. So it's going to be more challenging for us to assess what I would, you know, characterize as fugitive emissions mm -hmm. when you're talking about large clarifier tanks, large storage areas, you know, where there's wastewater that's being stored. Um, there's there's many different challenges of trying to assess emissions for some national factory. I guess uh, I apologize. I mixed up my words a little bit. Um, so the data collection, that makes sense. I appreciate the clarification. Um, I'm thinking also a little bit on the enforcement side. So if I understood the reporting correctly, there's uh, for the 2019 citation, uh, the public comment period is this week or last week or, or, or uh, the, uh, the agreement, they had to report to you by today, uh, if I understood correctly. And so that, that's a pretty big time gap. Um, I guess the, the main concern we have, and um, you know, we've we've been going back and forth with MDHHS forever, waiting for this data, um, is if there is a public health concern, it's it's pretty hard to 
regulate and, and actually do these enforcements in like a reasonable amount of time. So is that something that EGLE is thinking about or is that more in the MDHHS uh, purview? That, that's a little bit hazy on me. Well, we don't, we don't know what the recommendations are yet from the DHHS health consultation. So I wouldn't want to speculate on what they're going to recommend. Um, we have purview over, uh, you know, any air pollutants that, that could be of concern. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, we're definitely wanting to consider any option we have to enforce. Um, the challenge, like I said before, though, is that we don't traditionally permit wastewater treatment plants. So um, our analysis and, and kind of problem solving to figure out emissions or emission sources, um, especially related to odors, because odors are even more challenging. Right. Sure. You can have a situation where a facility is in compliance with all of their emission limits in a permit. But they could still be causing an odor situation. So in those situations, it's even more difficult because now we're reliant on nuisance odor regulation versus a um, emissions limit violation or stack test violation, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, obviously the wastewater treatment plant is being very cooperative with us. They're concerned and, and um, you know, have already taken action to try to problem solve and figure this out. So we're happy with you know, the, the, the work that we've been doing with them so far and in information sharing. Um, but we're really uh, waiting to see what recommendations that DHHS is going to want to Really, to be clear, they've been focusing on the hydrogen sulfide data. They've been looking at the viral suite data. They've been looking at our careful data as well as the EPA monitoring. So that's what they focused on. They, we shared the drone study and the drone information with them, but they've not on any conclusions or provided any recommendations. Mm -hmm. so they're not going to include that in the report. Okay. Uh, do you know, do any of you have any idea about the timeline of the MDHHS report? I know you're from Eagle. Uh, but there is a lot of frustration in the in the community that, uh, you know, that it, first they said that it would be uh, done early last year. So it's been almost a year and they keep pushing it back. Is there any, is there any talk and any I would, I would suggest that you invite them to one of these meetings. Um, and, then, and, and if they're not willing to do that, then I would suggest that you consult with them. I, I don't want yeah. to speak on the brand. No, I understand. Yeah, and I emailed, and basically the you know the response I get from uh, Department of Health and Human Services is it'll be done when it's done. So, uh, but that's actually a good idea. I might uh, invite representatives. Um, uh, is it your understanding that there have been uh, over the last few years, more of the 901 odor complaints or less of those 901 odor complaints since um, graphic packaging uh, began to take some odor mitigation, try some different odor mitigation uh, approaches? Well, just one before I'll let Rex answer this, but one thing I want to be clear about the presence of odors does not mean that it's a violation. There is a threshold that the odors need to be at in order for it to be a nuisance. So, you know, there's understandability and frustration with the odors, but the presence of odors, because we go out many times on complaint investigations and we'll smell odors, they don't rise to the level of being a nuisance odor. I can't say, mm -hmm. but Rex, I know we've got uh, Yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for Um, so kind of on what you were saying, you mentioned you operate under the Clean Air Act and then state regulation odor rule number 901, and you've been focusing a lot on odor. Um, going back to public health, is there a different specific regulation rule that you can operate under that is specific towards people's concerns about public health? Maybe I can ask you a question just to understand a little bit more. Are you asking this sort of specific citation that we could cite a company for public health concerns? 
basically, so, uh, slightly separately from the odor, since you seem to um, be separating that a little bit. So there, Rule 901 has two provisions. We have the nuisance requirement, or in very extreme situations, we can say for injurious effects. Rule 901A is the injurious public health effects that we could say for it, but the burden of evidence, the burden of proof to, to be able to send a violation for that is challenging. Yeah. It's very difficult. So we do have that ability, but um, we don't typically exercise it because the, the problem, the challenge that we have when you're looking at ambient air sampling looking at like the EnviroSuite data, or you're looking at our careful data, or you're looking at anything that's off the property of the facility, it's very challenging to be able to identify what is the source of those emissions. Because you could you could say this hydrogen sulfide is definitely coming from this facility. But in an urban area with other facilities around other potential sources of hydrogen sulfide, the company can easily and and effectively argue away how did you establish that we're the one causing this injurious effect? So we don't typically cite for, for that sort so of provision. What, we're, what requirements, I understand that would be a complicated process. So what are those types of requirements that would be needed to be able to prove that? So I'll give an example. Um, uh, uh, we had a facility um, that was a, um, I probably shouldn't give all the details, but they, um, they were manufacturing uh, material that used a chemical that was very dangerous. They had um, roof leaks, and whenever the moisture was introduced to this chemical, it would create chlorine gas clouds. They had actually caused fires, and fortunately, the wind was always blowing away from town, but chlorine gas releases occurred several times mm -hmm. that um, could have potentially killed people. So we, we did use 901A in that situation. That was very, I mean, it, I couldn't, the photos of this place and to see what the roof looked like and the tons of this chemical they were storing us, it was very obvious that there was an imminent public health threat. So you don't have um, any more laborious examples that would have taken some more research to prove that? Well, it just but, so part of our program is we do do a toxics review for every permit that we issue. We, and Michigan is actually um, unique in that we do have a toxic air pollutant regulation. Um, the Clean Air Act actually doesn't specify the same level that Michigan has. So the way we utilize our toxic rules is through our permitting process. When a facility submits a permit application to um, whatever the process is that they're, they're making, um, we will do a review to see if there's any toxic pollutants of concern. And there are many situations where um, we will set specific toxic gluten limits in a permit. So the way we get at um, toxics evaluation is typically through a permitting process. But for a facility that potentially doesn't need permits with us, or has never gone through an air permit before, um, you know, we wouldn't have that same um, review that would have been done. And that's typically what, how we're looking at the toxic regulations. Yeah, um, you know, both both of the graphic permits uh, have process equipment that have uh, certain toxic limits in them. Uh, two of the paper machines, for example, have a formaldehyde emission limit. So we evaluate that as part of our own analysis inspections, reviewing material usage and records to assess. Two more quick questions about the, the, the monitoring. The formaldehyde monitoring that's coming up, the monitoring hardware that you're going to be using, does that belong exclusively to Eagle? Because it sounds like much of the data collection in the past has been done on shared hardware. And then is there a list of the chemicals that you'd be testing for? Because yeah, as, as we saw the emphasis of hydrogen sulfide potentially allowed us to miss some of the nitric oxides and formaldehydes that potentially were there for a long time. Yeah, so the the equipment we're using um, has a, a method, a reference test method called TO11A. Uh, and so it's going to be uh, monitoring for 
liquor bottles. Um, and so it's, it's looking at primarily uh, chemical structures that are aldehydes, including formaldehyde. But it also can look at um, another organic chemical group of ketones. So they're, um, I'm not sure the exact number of chemicals, but it's, it's in the, I think, 40 range of things that will. And that's all being designed by Eagle. But yeah, we're fabricating the equipment. We we've, we've designed the method. We we're it, this. You can imagine this takes a lot of effort to kind of figure out the logistics. So we've got quite a few people that have been working on this. Um, and yeah, we we. The nice thing about this is that it's an established methodology. It um, uses methodologies that are uh, recommended by EPA. The, what he referenced the TL11A. Sure. So um, this is much more um, um, rooted in, in kind of how we would problem solve or investigate the situation as opposed to the drone study. I have kind of a judgment question maybe. Um, so I could be misremembering, but it's, at least it's anecdotal that we're seeing on the north side neighborhood elevated incidences of uh, side effects or personal health effects that are associated with these toxic gases uh, exposure over time. And so with the long-awaited MDHHS data, which I'm sure you guys are looking forward to as well, um, do you feel like we're zeroing in on an answer anytime soon about who's responsible, if there's any part responsible party, but it seems to be the case, at least we just need to find out who. But uh, yeah, do you feel like we're getting close to an answer at all? I'll leave that to you to decide what close means as well. I, you know, I know that DHHS takes into consideration as part of their health consultation any sort of ailments in the community, mm -hmm. the hospitalizations, the asthma rates, um, cancer. All I think my understanding is part of their evaluation. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think that they're looking at all those things, but again, I, I wouldn't want to speculate on what the recommendations are going to be. Obviously, this is a, a very high priority for us. And Rex and his team have been spending a lot of time and effort following up on the complaint, working with the citizens to try to identify the, the, the sources of the problem. We're, we're committed to trying to, 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 to give some relief to the community. Um, and, and we're very, um, I think we're excited about being able to show this odor minimization plan that we've ne negotiated on the consent order. Um, that. Uh, Specifics in that consent order, I'm, I'm very hopeful, are going to reduce nuisance odors. I've um, worked a lot with the company to establish infrastructure where we think that some of the, at least some of the odors are coming from. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be some relief, hopefully, that we'll be able to um, provide to the community and, and show what we've been working on. But, you know, if odor complaints continue, if, if there's problems that continue, we're, we're going to stay on the case. Um, so there's a way that, you know, citizens can make a complaint about an, an odor. Is there a way for citizens to make a direct complaint if they feel that there is a, a negative health outcome based on air quality? Yeah, it's part of our online odor complaint. So when somebody files a complaint, they can do it online or they can call the district office. But there is... Um, there's a whole series of uh, drop-down boxes and different spots that you can add information and health concerns. It's definitely something that we want to hear about, so we've got it specifically in that um, uh, that online um, system. Is that the, the environmental assistance center? It's the ATV online complaint system. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we also, gotcha. We also get complaints yeah, through our uh, pollution emergency learning system, we don't see these yeah. uh, mm -hmm. these numbers. Yeah. Um, that's that's a 24-7 call for that. Our um, our online complaint system um, is designed to um, we receive a notification in the district office, but the, the limitation of it is you can file that 24 hours a day. Um, but we only receive the notification during normal business hours. So 
our preference is if, if you have an odor complaint after you know eight to five, we would prefer you call our fees system because they call us direct after right. that. Right. But we have been following up on complaints yes, on off do. hours as well because we do recognize that there's the potential for weather inversion. Uh, maybe there's an upset of the facility that occurs, you know, after hours. So there's been many examples where Rex's group has gone out in the middle of the night or on weekends to, to, to see if there's um, any 901 violations or any other issues that we can document. So, yeah, we, we this is, unfortunately, there's sources across the state where we have similar issues with orders. And um, so we've got dedicated procedures and the, the best ways to try to investigate and, and document these things. And showing up during off hours is definitely one of our strategies. Uh, with Siegel's enforcement action against traffic packaging, um, is that sort of open-ended? Is it, is it ongoing? Is there some sort of endpoint to that? My understanding is if they, if at some point they don't comply, that it there could be there would be a fine associated with um, with with non-compliance. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. So first of all, there's going to be a public hearing coming up in the near future on the proposed consent order, and, and we're we're definitely looking to get community input on the proposed documents. So that's the next step. My understanding is we're very close to starting the public comment period for the ACO. Um, so once the ACL goes through public comments and, and we're able to um, review all of the comments we received from the community, we'll make a decision then, do we want to make changes based on comments that we've heard, um, or are we ready to move forward with finalizing the, the consent order? Once the consent order is finalized, um, it, there is a lifespan to them. Um, typically, I think it's five years. I'm not exactly sure what the, how long this is supposed to be for, but um, at any given time during those five years, um, if there is a violation documented that's in the ACO, then we have the ability to collect stipulated penalties. So it's an additional deterrent beyond just a documented violation um, that gives, you know, we have that um, power through the ACO. I think it is good to mention, though, that we are um, going to be starting negotiations for a second consent order now related to the most recent violation notice that we just issued to the facility. So we're actually going to end up with two consent orders. Uh, one really dealing with the odor issues, and then the second one dealing with some of the back testing violations, record keeping deficiencies, other things that were documented um, uh, when we were out there. So we're I have a lot of ability to be able to collect stipulated penalties for violations in the future. I also wanted to mention there was uh, there was an opportunity to make uh, environmental air uh, concern complaints on our. The AQD web page is like right there. You just click on it. Uh, those are handled eight to five. But if you have 24 hours, there are pollution emergency alert system. Um, people are taking care of the phones, and that number is 800-292-4706. Uh, you make a complaint, and someone follows up on it right away. And all of this information is on our graphic packaging web page. Got a dedicated eco air quality web page for graphic packaging. We're trying to um, keep things updated and almost in real time when we're um, sending out a new letter, receiving additional information from the company. So that's where I always point people to if they want to find out the history or any of these contact numbers, that sort of stuff is all on that page. Um, I know, uh, I, I don't remember the timeline of this, but about a year ago, uh, Eagle Police Report and, or, uh, you know, did some public uh, 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 explanation of, uh, you know, reviewing data about the mission. And, and what Eagle, I'm paraphrasing now, said at that point that there was no data uh, that Eagle analyzed that uh, showed any short-term health health concerns. Am I am I correct uh, in that paraphrasing? So this was part of our uh, community update meeting that we right. had back in October right. of 21. Yeah. And um, uh, as part of that presentation, we also had uh, Department of Health and Human Services 
um, had a presentation and also uh, USCPA Region 5 Chicago did a presentation about their mobile lab they brought out. Um, and uh, with, with the mobile lab, that coincided over the time where we were operating our two critical monitors on the River Drive. Drive. So, um, so each agency was basically just updating where things stood, you know, at the time, you know, with the data that we had. It. So at the time, the statement was there, there is no evidence of uh, short-term uh, negative health effects to folks that live in that, in, in that area. Yeah, there, there's several uh, health uh, value uh, concentrations that are set. There's a, uh, an acute, a short-term value that uh, is set at 70 parts per billion. Um, and then there's a uh, value that's set for a 14-day to less than one-year exposure but that's set at 20 parts per billion. And um, the the careful monitoring that we did for the six-week study in April and May of 2021, um, both of those monitors, um, the average was under 10. So yes, there was not a short-term uh, exposure based based on our sampling. Data. Right. So that that database claim that there, you know, there wasn't there's uh, at that time with the data available that there wasn't a uh, uh, health risk to people that live in that area is, you know, can be reassuring for those folks in that time, at, at, you know, in that place at that time. And I know that we're waiting for uh, word from Michigan Department of Health and Human Services about long-term data, but in, in the intervening year, has, is there any more uh, data or analysis of that data that EGLE has that has, um, shown any longer term health effects uh, based on the air quality in and around graphic packaging and because that's really the main question that, that folks in, in the community want to know. Well, I think, I think that's why we have been working with DHHS. That's why we have collaborated with them on this. I'll go back to what I said originally um, because this is, again, unfortunately not unique. We've had other situations where folks have not only been experiencing odors, but are also experiencing health effects. So our first step always, when we have someone who's um, getting dizzy, getting sick, you know, whatever it might be that is alarming, we're contacting DHHS, brain and the health experts, and we have issued um, orders under the health code uh, when we've had an imminent public health threat, cease that operation. So we put this in DHHS's hands and ask them to give us direction. If there's any action that needs to be taken based upon the data. And, you know, we've been information sharing, like I said, and, and meeting with them um, and, and having conversations on this. But, you know, the health consultation will give any recommendations or conclusions of the data. Okay. And, and the city is also continuing to share all of the environmental suite data mm -hmm. from both, you know, on their uh, facility grounds and also in the community. So that's, they're, you know, that, I believe that's being assessed by DHHS. What is the uh, environmental suite data sharing like from graphic packaging side? Is that do you take a snapshot, or is they are they sort of shoveling all that, you know, just sending all of that data to, um, to Eagle under the consent agreement? So we have the ability to request that at any time. We did um, request that data when we were doing our care poll, so that we had data from both the city graphics and our care poll monitors for uh, the same time period. Mm -hmm. So we're comparing. I know one question that I've had uh, in attending the odor task force meetings is um, graphic presentation of the EnviroSuite data from graphic packaging, which they've yet to really provide in those meetings. They'll give a spreadsheet or kind of talk about the values, but I haven't seen a, a graph. This, this uh, water reclamation plant has the, um, the website where you can go and see a graph over time of uh, hydrogen sulfide um, emissions. Has there been any talk uh, in as you're you know finishing up negotiating the um, consent agreement of some type of uh, public reporting, basically the same type of, you know, easily understandable 
graphic information of of emissions. Um, you know, that's something we've encouraged them to do. Um, and uh, that, you know, that's a great, great comment. So th this would probably be something that the community could put in the input uh, with public comment period. Correct. I think it would do a lot to, um, uh, uh, you know, address the public's concerns about um, about emissions if there wasn't, you know, a, a pretty easily understandable graph of over time of emissions, even if it's just the hydrogen sulfide, which doesn't cover, like you said, all of the um, all of the different uh, compounds that might be uh, released by the facility. But hydrogen sulfide, yes, it's easier to uh, uh, monitor and it can be a key indicator that would, if that's elevated, then you would want to go look for other other substances. Any other questions? I have one final question, just to kind of like understand the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, and it's, I think I already know the answer, but it's a problem we run into at the ECC all the time, and I'm sure you guys do too. Um, are there any statutory tools that allow democracy to influence your enforcement decisions versus just the science? And what I'm saying is our whole discussion has basically been it's really hard to establish clear linkages, you know, um, and we run into this and not even just odor stuff, but all over the place. Are there any uh, tools, uh, at the legal framework tools that, uh, let's say, as an extreme example, a thousand people report they smell an odor or very strong, you guys show up in a reasonable amount of time, don't detect it, but that's still a thousand people, that's a lot of people. So are there, are there any tools at our disposal that allow the democratic side versus simply the science, which is really hard to establish? Well, I, I love the question, and it's, it's something we always encourage um, folks that have concerns about air pollution to do. It, it's change the law. Give us more ability to enforce. We're limited by what the law allows us to do. Mm -hmm. right? And the, the way that laws change is through community involvement. We're putting pressure on your legislature, your local officials. Uh, they're the ones that have the influence to change our rules and regs. And if we are given more ability to enforce, then we, we, we're civil servants. We do, we do what the law allows us to do. The way to enact or make change is, is through changes in the law. Um, when, when's the public comment period again? It hasn't um, started yet. Um, do you know when it starts? Very soon. Okay. Um, within the next, I would say within the month. Is the hearing already scheduled? I, well, we have, I mean, there's a tentative date. Yeah, we until, and is that a public hearing where you could give public comment at the hearing? Yep. Mm -hmm. Would that occur in this room, just like the um, air, the air mod, or the uh, permitting uh, sure hearing did? We, we yeah. haven't decided officially yet. Uh, okay. The last one we did was virtual, yeah. so we're probably leaning towards a virtual meeting. We haven't decided for sure. Yeah, it would allow for phone calls then. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. So there's a minimum of a 45-day public comment period okay. on mm -hmm. the uh, okay. ACO. So uh, you know, we'd accept um, phone call messages, uh, yeah. Yeah. Letters, in writing, email, and, and whatever right. work. Uh, okay. There would also be uh, like a, as part of that public hearing, uh, there would be uh, an information session ahead of the start of the formal public hearing where you can make formal public comments uh, at that time if you wish. Um, can I ask one more? Um, the, you said about the permit um, ap application where companies have to go through the process to let you know what chemicals they're going to use as a good determinant of like possible problems in the future. You said, uh, mentioned there's uh, some instances where that hasn't had to happen, or so what are the requirements and how often is that required to be updated? For example, when we're still figuring out the uh, PFAS uh, parts per trillion issues that pr previously wasn't a problem. So how often are those types of things reassessed where companies would have to disclose? All the time. Okay. So PFAS is a great example. Um, PFAS is actually a, a family of chemicals. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about hundreds of different yep. compounds and chemicals. So we've had to, the, 
understood that each one, one individually is the only yep. permitting, and then develop health screening levels. We've got a, a group of toxicologists in our division that we will work with. And say we have a facility comes in and part of their chemical process is going to be emitting some We know that that's going to be a pollutant in, in the permit that's going to be, need to be addressed, but we don't have any health screening levels at this time. We'll share the specific compound with our toxicologist. They do a literature review um, and they will develop a level, a health screening level that they would set as far as this is protective of public health and we, that's the limit of this. So as new compounds, new chemicals come up or as new literature or scientific reviews come up, we might revisit health screening levels from older pollutants. Green oxide is a great example of one that was, was um, I won't go into all this here now, but <laughs> that was, that's a uh, that, that was a chemical that was um, revisited, revised, and greatly reduced as far as the acceptable health training levels because of some health studies that were done. So I've seen the process uh, a bit for some of those and how long it can take. So we're waiting basically till one is assessed and is determined at whatever bad level. Um, before, before then, any companies would have to disclose that they use those in their process? It depends. I know that's going to I'd say that, but it depends on a lot of things. It depends on do, are they required to get a permit? Um, do we have reason to believe that they're emitting it? What have we seen from other facilities that are similar to it? Um, it's not always a straight, like, yes, we're going to review this. So if the company is required to provide us all the data that we and need to do in a review. So we're pretty good at, at being able to identify pollutants of concern if we do an inspection of the facility. But, um, there's some facilities that don't have to go through the permitting process. Mm -hmm. And the way our toxic rules work, we don't have the ability, this is a great example of changing the law, we don't have the ability to enforce the toxic rules for a facility that doesn't have a permit. Require permit. There are some limited circumstances where we can, but we're, we're pretty limited in those circumstances. So, um, yeah, it's typically through the permitting process. When we have the Well, thank you so much for yeah. uh, coming yeah. in this evening. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. And we'll be talking to you all the Yeah. Yeah, public yeah. hearing. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 All right. Uh, can we get the agenda back up? Okay. Don't mind. Thank you. We will continue on with the meeting, although. Um, about 6.39, we typically go uh, till about 6 or 6.30. Um, I would suggest maybe wrapping things up here. Um, we have um, uh, a few folks in the audience, I think, that might uh, be interested in uh, coming back next month as applicants uh, to go through the interview process with us. Cool. And so I appreciate anybody that has shown up tonight uh, that might want to uh, apply and interview for our, uh, we have one open seat. And then we'll have another open seat in um, January when I am turned out. So um, also, uh, so are, is there any, uh, does anybody, is everybody good with kind of cutting it off here and, and heading out? We can do uh, uh, subcommittee reports next month. Right. I got nothing okay. to unless there's any citizen comments. Uh, yeah, do we have any other, are there any other phone calls? And did anybody else want to make uh, any comments that is, here this evening. I don't know if anybody's waiting to do it. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Okay. Jeff, would you like to make comments? No? Okay. Yeah. Well, I just keep coming. I don't know if they should or not. Uh, I'm Jeff Chamberlain, Deputy City Manager. Uh, again, it's yeah. stuff about the things that are in Michigan. You know, I really appreciate this discussion that the, the ECC is, is facilitating. Uh, it, it's part of the charge of this board. Mm -hmm. Actually, is to educate the community and to collect data. Um, you know, everything that Director Baker said here tonight, uh, the folks from the state of Michigan, I think for us in the city manager's office, some of the key things is, you know, we, we need to learn what we don't know as far as these new topics. Um, and this plant has been our plant, the, the city's wastewater treatment plant, which takes in waste from not just the city, the whole region. Yeah, 
and industries, not just graphic packaging, but many other industries, right. Western Michigan University, every, you know, houses, apartments, you name it, it all ends up there at the wastewater treatment plant eventually. Mm -hmm. And every city has a wastewater treatment plant for the most part. So there's a lot of great practice, national <laughs> best practices out there. But at the same time, we know that, you know, if there's an issue, we need to find out what it really is. And, you know, let's address it. Right. So that's why over the last couple of years, we've, we've had multi-million dollar contracts to start making additional changes to the plan um, because we can do it. And, and to the credit of the city commission, they have had to make some hard decisions about what does that mean as far as ratepayers go for that plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the path that we're continuing to, to push is to see, you know, what's the right information that we can gather. Um, Let's go above and beyond what is required by the regulators. You know, that's why, you know, they were talking about these drone studies. You know, we've never done a drone study on the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah. Um, and regulators don't tell us we have to, but it's, it's a tool that we can do to be a better advocate for our own citizens. And so let's use that tool. So um, I just want to say we're going to keep doing that. Uh, we're going to keep working with the, the folks from the state, from EGLE. We are. Just like a lot of you have the same questions about when the health report is going to come out, we've been kind of making some back channel pushes also to really enforce upon the state folks or impress upon them that this is so important to the city of Kalamazoo and its citizens. We we need to get this report out there to the public. We don't know what it says either. Mm -hmm. um, so we're continuing to do that too. So again, just wanted to thank the ECC for um, having these folks here tonight. And again, any questions that come up, we're more than happy, either Director Baker, myself, or if you need to pull in outside experts uh, to come here and talk with you and the public, we'll, we're more than happy to do that. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what about meeting in December? Is there any uh, opinion about that? In the past, uh, we had uh, occasionally canceled the December meeting. People on a holiday, that kind of what thing. What date would that fall on this year? Do you know? I think it's the 21st. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can decide next there's time. enough going on that there's reason to meet, and yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, you yeah. can decide that. Yeah, raise the idea of inviting the Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I'll put the invitation no, out there. Yeah, I don't know that they're going to be interested to come until they've That's got something mean, to tell yeah, us, you know. Months. Yeah, they'll yeah. come in November. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If they came in, yeah. If they come, there's a reason to meet. For sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Them well, then let's review come. next month yeah. Yeah. and yeah. see and see where we're at. Uh, also, I encourage everybody to think about who's going to take over doing the agenda and running the meetings when I'm when I'm gone. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have to. If we don't meet in December, we'll have to kind of. Well, I guess you guys. I have to think about that till January. No, you would vote on it on we want to have November that. We before, want to have yeah, because somebody's got to <laughs> yep. get the agenda, right? That's right. Okay. You have to run That's it. Right. So. Yeah. So let's so let's put that on a November agenda agenda as an item to discuss leadership going, yeah. going forward. Yeah. Well, what does say Aaron can't leave? That's the well, that's not. Well, in the, I mean, we could you could change the, the bylaws because it's in the bylaws. <laughs> but I I have taken my turn and it is somebody else's turn. <laughs> broken. Yeah. There's no yeah. law that can't be broken. Um, are there, are there any other callers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, okay. No callers. And were there any uh, comments through social media? Uh, yes, but I did not read through them ahead of time. So okay. they know that's not a proper channel technically. Okay. Awesome. Great. <laughs> uh, any other comments for the good of the order? I have one very quick comment yeah. that I want to um, end on a happy note and yeah. celebrate. I have a um, commitment and a resolution from the City of Portage to join the Partnership for an Urban Growth Treaty application. Very good. All right. Very good. Outstanding. And uh, uh, the recommendation uh, that we sent uh, to City uh, Commission uh, will be read uh, November 17th? November 7th. November 7th. Right. So then they read it once and then come back to it a few weeks later the following month to approve no, or disapprove? It's, it's still be a resolution. Oh, okay. Great. So I'm tired of being put off. We're things are moving we're, right we're, along. We're doing it. We're doing it. All right. Very good. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. We are adjourned. All right. Take care. Cool. That was a doozy. Yeah. I have like more questions for them. Uh,